2 Corinthians chapter number 5. This morning is Labor Day, this weekend's Labor Day weekend, and I just want to spend a little time uh, kind of really wrapping up. We, we wrapped up the heavenly places and the heaven study and so forth, and uh, I just want to kind of tie a rag on the bush with that. I won't be here next week, and when we come back, we'll get into some other things and uh, some other topics. The first Monday in September was designated in 1894 to be Labor Day weekend, to be a celebration, a tribute to the contribution and achievement of the American worker. It was, it was uh, founded and pushed forward by the, the labor unions in, in, the, in, in the day, in the late 19th century. And so we stop, we have a big party, we have barbecues, we do all this stuff to celebrate our labor. Have you ever noticed that's still a lot of work? <laughs> you know, go to the restaurant, let somebody else do it, you know. But it is what it is, and, and we, we take that time. But in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about our labor. And I just want to kind of talk about that this morning and, and really our focus in that. Verse number 9, Paul says, Wherefore we labor, th- that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. That's a we labor. He co- comes over in 2 Corinthians 3, and he says, we are labors together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, sorry. We'll get there in just a second. We labor. There is some labor. But notice in verse 9, he says, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Our work here, and now we're, we are accepted in the beloved. Because of our who we are in Christ and our identity, because we've been to Calvary, because we trusted in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the the benefits, one of the blessings that he gives us is the, accept, is the issue of all of our sins are forgiven, therefore we are accepted in the beloved, the beloved one, okay? And because of that, we are accepted. We are good to go. But, but then Paul's talking here about our labor, our work. Come over to Ephesians chapter 2, just quickly. Uh, you have your list there. We're off the list already, so you know what's going to happen to the list. Okay, so look at Ephesians 2, if you will. Ephesians 2, and, uh, and then the, um, well, Colossians 4, but we'll get there. Ephesians 2, look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. There's a set of good works that we are to do. Come over to Colossians 4. Colossians 4, verse number 12. There is some good works. There's some activity. There's some, there, in Ephesians 4, verse 1, he says, I want you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And there's a, there's a work there that, has, that needs to be done. So we're going to labor. And what, when we labor, we want our work, our labor, to be accepted of him. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 is talking about. If you look at Colossians 4, verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So back in, in first Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5, when Paul says, we're going to labor, absent or present, we're working, we're working on your behalf, we're working with you, we're doing the work of the ministry, And he says, you know what? I want that activity to be acceptable to him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all, and and here's why. Here's why I want my labor, my work, my activity, my my, uh, good works to do. And, And that thing in Ephesians 2, where his workmanship created unto good works. There's a set of good works in Paul's epistles that we call it the grace life, you know? And you, and you begin to, to do some activities. In Ephesians 2, uh, Ephesians 4 there, Paul calls it the work of the ministry. The why is verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Why do we want our work in the ministry, our our labor to be accepted? Because there's a future day coming out there. The judgment seat of Christ is coming. And when we stand there and come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we go through that event that Paul calls the judgment seat of Christ, and we've looked at this, 
in, in the past studies, 1 Corinthians 3, when we go through that, that our labor then can be, be metered out, be, be reconciled out. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, he says, For we are labors together with God. I love that. We are labors together with who? With God. Romans 8, if God be for you, who can be against you? Who can separate you from the love of Christ? Nothing can. No one. So, you know, sometimes we get in our mind about working and doing, and we forget that we're working with who? With God. We try to do it on our own steam, in our own effort, in our own flesh. And you know what happens when we do that? <laughs> you know, we have a picnic. <laughs> Nothing happens. Nothing good comes out of it. But when we step back and we say, you know what? I am who I am because of the grace of God and, and who I am in Christ. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to do some work. And I'm going to do it for Him. I'm going to do it with Him. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Now watch what, God, what Paul's laboring in. And, and that's what got me. You know, you think about laboring. I watched a documentary on uh, Ford, Henry Ford and the first assembly line and, and what drove them to the assembly line approach. You know, and those guys were, it was taking them a long time to build one car. You know, and then they, they developed that assembly line where one guy got good at one thing. You know, one man, at the very beginning, one, two guys built the whole car. So they had to have knowledge in all the aspects, systems. And Henry figured out I can do it quicker if one guy knows how to do wheels, another guy knows how to do this, and we can just roll it. And they had it on a, on a, well, we call it a conveyor belt, but they had it on a rope. And there were four guys on the end of the rope that pulled that goofy car through the plant until he figured out how to put a motor on the rope and, and, and got the, the, the conveyor belt going. It, when we think about I think about that, I go, okay, but what was Paul doing? What was Paul laboring? He says, I want my labor to be acceptable. Well, look at verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is who? What was, Paul, what was Paul building? Paul was building Romans 16. He says that we preach the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You see, Paul is building in the word of his grace, Acts 20. It says the word of his grace will build up in you. He, he, Paul's laboring in the doctrine and in the word and in the truth, and he's putting it down in you, getting it into you. Come back to 2 Corinthians 5. And our labor, I, it just I, it fascinates me about what we're to be building in. 2 Corinthians 5 there, verse number 10, he says, one, one may receive the things done in his body, in, inside, inner man. Not by his body, not for his body. You know, you, you, the four is, the, the gyms are open now, so everybody clamoring. You know, during the shutdowns and everything, you couldn't find workout equipment anywhere. That wasn't a thousand bucks for a goofy dumbbell. I'm like, a thousand dollars, really? He's like, yeah. I'm like, ooh, no. <laughs> Don't think so. I, I can do the 12 ounce lifts with the can of Coke, you know? <laughs> that didn't even work, okay? No, he's not building it inside of you, in your inner man. Verse 20 here's our vocation. Ephesians 4.1. Here's, here's what we're going to be building. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. That's our job. That's what we're to be building into us. That's what we're to come along and we're to take and we're to build it into our inner man. That issue of who we are. That issue of our ambassadorship. We glance back up to verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ constrains us. How about let's build in the love of Christ, not our love for Christ, because some days we're good at it and other days we're bad at it, you know? You roll over tomorrow morning and you just want to take a double-barrel shotgun to the alarm clock. You're done, you know, you had enough. Well, not tomorrow, it's a holiday. <laughs> Tuesday, okay? But no, what happens is, is we, let's take the love of Christ, 
in Ephesians, he says, hey, the, the, whole, the Spirit dwells in your inner man, strengthens in your inner man, that you may be able to know and to comprehend and to understand with all the saints, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ, the love of God. Build that into our inner man. Build, let that work down into us. How about Ephesians 1, verse 3? How about let's build into our inner man this issue of that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Boy, what is that category? The spiritual blessing category. We begin to work that into our inner man. The fact that if you look down there, verse 4, He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be. Before the foundation of the world, the Godhead said, this is what we're going to do, this is the status of the body of Christ. That we should be. What's the first one? Holy. Holy. Ain't that a, what a wonderful, not W-H-O-L-E, but holy, <laughs> Sat, sanctified, set apart for the purpose which He's created us to be. What did He create us to do? Fill up those heavenly places we've spent the last three months looking at. Man, let's learn about that. That's when we spent three, four months on that. Learn about it, study, get it into our thinking, because if you go out in that world out there, it's not a... It's a depressing place, isn't it? But man, not when your mind, not when your thinking is, as the song says, stayed upon Him. And you begin to look at Him and you begin to, hey, you know what? I'm holy and without blame before Him in love. Boy, isn't it wonderful to know that before Him in love you are blameless? Because all you got to do is talk to somebody around you and you know what they're going to do to you? They're going to blame you. A lot of blame goes around in the world today. God says, no, you're, you're blameless. You're without blame. Verse 5, we've got the adoption. We're predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus. That word adoption, Romans 8 defines it to wit, the redemption of our body. He's predestinated us to have what? A new body function out there in the heavenly places. Verse 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. One of the top things, according to the, the uh, survey people out there in the psychology world and stuff, one of the top things, the top problems that people have is the issue of acceptance. Because they're looking for it. Isn't it wonderful to know that you're accepted in Him the one that will never let you down, the one that will never disappoint you, the one that will never fail you. Usually we're looking for acceptance in our spouses or in our children or in our work. And you know what happens? All of those categories will drop the ball and let you down. But when your eyes stay on Him and you build Him up in that inner man and you come and you say, you know what, I'm going to labor. Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that studying is weary to the flesh. <laughs> I'm going to labor there, and I'm going to do what I need to do for me. Build up inside of my inner man so I can go and be that ambassador. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through the, His blood. Boy, isn't that wonderful? We've been redeemed. We've been redeemed from the slave market of sin down there. We have been redeemed. And what do we have? The forgiveness of sins. That's tremendous to know that your sins have been forgiven. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to mess up. You're going to sin. And when that happens, you know what you're going to say? You know what? I have forgiveness as a present possession. Verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. When he says that he's abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, how much wisdom? Are you going to miss something? Just so you know that, look at the next verse. He says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. He's made known the what? 
the mystery of his will. We have all wisdom, all prudence, all knowledge, all understanding. We have it all. It's been given to us in his word. What do, so where, where am I going to labor? In his word. Get that in my, into my thinking. Into my daily life. I tell you, you read three chapters a day, you know what's going to happen. It's going to change the way you talk. It's going to change the way you think. It's going to move you. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. The labor. Laboring. We want our labor to be accepted. Why? Because the judgment seat's coming. There's a day of accountability coming. But in 1 Timothy 4 verse 8, there's a very interesting thing that how Paul says this. 1 Timothy 4, verse number 8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto, what? All things. Having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. You know why you want to labor in the Word? You know why you want to put it in there? Because there's a promise of life. Godliness. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. Godliness has a promise of life that now is and out there in the future to come. Notice the verse, bodily exercise profiteth little. I love that. <laughs> you know, if you're going to exercise in life, exercise requires discipline. You know that? The gyms were closed. So what did the... What did the weightlifter guys and the exercise fiends do? They went up and bought every piece of exercise equipment in the valley, didn't they? And they're doing it at home, aren't they? And as soon as last week the gyms opened, what happened? They all filled back in, didn't they? Now next week they'll say it's because of the gym, so we'll be back down on shutdown. That's so stupid. But what it is is, what do you do when you exercise? The issue is discipline in your life. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about get some discipline into your inner man. Get that inner man into shape. At home, I have a rower, a rowing machine. And I have a plan. (laughs) Have a plan. (laughs) Okay? Get up, go work, row for a couple minutes. Get a shower, get some breakfast, you know. Leisure morning, right? I got got a plan. I didn't say it was a good one, but I got one, you know. I go out in the morning and, and, and practice with the archery and everything on the side. You know, I got a plan. But what what is that? It requires discipline, doesn't it? There's a discipline here. Bodily exercise. Now, the reference in the context is back up to verse 2 and 3 about religion and all of the religious activities that religion says you need to perform to get and to gain and to do, all the ceremonies, the rites and the rituals, and all that physical stuff there in the, in the, in the context here. And you and I understand, you, you go back over there to Galatians 4 about that issue of the law and performing and and working. Galatians 4, verse number 9. Galatians 4, 9, but, but, But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how again, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You know what happens is when you begin to exercise and you get back up into that religious wheel, you think you're laboring, but really you're on the treadmill. And you know what you're doing? You're, you're desiring to be under bondage again. Weak and beggarly. You know what weak does? Weak isn't strong, is it? Weak is, oh, why, why work out? I'll just roll over. Another, another five minutes ain't going to hurt. No, weak, you need to get strong. You need to go exercise. Beggarly, that's poverty, isn't it? That stuff in Ephesians 1, according to the riches of His grace. According to the riches. 
See, we're wealthy. We're not begging. We've got it all. We just got to get in there and dig it out and work it through. We can bear again to be in bondage. It's a workout system with no real ability to make your inner man strong. Actually, if you turn over to chapter 6 of Galatians, verse 12, as, a, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. There it is. You know what you're doing? You know why mirrors are on the walls in gyms? So you can look at yourself, right? That's what you do in a mirror. <laughs> it's so you know your form's right, according to Arnold. You know? You know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is. You guys okay? It's only Sunday morning. You got the rest of the weekend off here in a minute. See, what happens is, is what do you do in the gym? You start posing, you start, it's a fair show in the flesh. And that's really the issue here. When you begin to labor and you begin to work to build up in that inner man who you really are, who are you, so that you're not on that treadmill of law and legalism and working and doing, but rather you sit there and you say, you know what, I am so thankful for the grace of God and for the riches bestowed on me. Come back over to Galatians 4. And that issue in godliness, 1 Timothy 4 there, verse 8, but bodily exercise profiteth little. You know, by the way, there is profit in some of that, but it's what? Little. But godliness is profitable unto all things. The law system, the legalism, the, the rolling and all that, little. But you know what gets it all? Godliness. Galatians 4, verse number 19. Here's the issue in godliness. Galatians 4, 19. Here's the goal. My little children of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. There's the issue that we're working for that we're laboring for. When Paul says, my labor be acceptable of him, you know what he's doing? Christ be formed in me. That's what he's after. That's what he's working for. He says, hey, godliness is profitable unto all things. Christ be formed in me. Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. Notice verse number 5, Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You know what? I'm going to have Christ formed in me. I'm going to have His mind, His thinking be in me. Chapter 1, verse 21, Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ. I'm going to have Christ be my life. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to have Him be what's formed in me. I'm going to have His mind be mine. I'm going to have His life be mine. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But who? But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh. Where's that? That's right here, right now. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Come over to Colossians 3. You see, when he says that godliness is profitable unto all things, and it's the promise of what now is. What am I laboring right now? What am I doing? I'm having Christ formed in me. I'm coming along and I'm having His life be my life. I'm coming along and I'm having His mindset be my mindset. We didn't look in chapter 3 of Philippians, but He's becoming the center of my all. He's my goal. He's where I'm after. You come over there in Philippians, well, you're in, you're in Colossians 3, hold on to there. And in Philippians 4, He says, He's my strength. He's my all. That's why Galatians 2.20 hangs on the back of the room. People, my dear wife says, that is one ugly poster. I said, yeah, but it's what's on the ugly poster that's important. 
Because what does it do? It reminds us, you know what? It's not I, it's Christ. He is what I'm building into my life. He's where my labor is. Colossians 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are, where? Above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. If I'm going to seek the things that are above, where am I going to be in the Word of God? Israel's program, the Old Testament, the Hebrew epistles, the book of the Revelation, or the Apostle Paul? How about let's try Paul, okay? We're pre the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Why? Because Christ, Paul comes in, Christ through Paul says, hey, you've been set. You, you're seated together, Ephesians 2, 6, in heavenly places with Him. You're there. You're there already. You got the door shut and the lock's on the door so you can't leave. It's done. Then he says, set your affections on things above not on things on the earth. So we're going to be seeking the right information from the right source, and then we're going to set your affection. Isn't that an interesting word, affection? What do you love? Who do you love? Affection. What's driving you? He says, man, you know what you need to set? You need to be seeking who you are in Christ, learn that information, get it in you, have Him become your all, because then when you, you're going to set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And I know what happens, because it's been said to me, yeah, but Rick, I still got to go to the, to the job. Yeah, you do, but how about let's go in the, in the theme and in the tenor of Ephesians 6. Doing it for Christ and not for men pleasers. Doing it with the right attitude. Oh, but you don't know, man, Rick, I hate my job. I, I, by the way, that's why I quit mine. <laughs> okay. yeah, you can. It's a free country. You can move around. There's still a lot of jobs out there. But see, you're running because you're running of the wrong reason. Oh, it's so awful. It's this or that. There was a survey I, I saw last or two weeks ago. Like something like 80, 80, 85 percent of people live, work in a hostile work environment, and they will not leave because of the benefits. I was like, wow. Like, that's amazing to me to stay because you got health care or retirement. But they do because what's important to them? That stuff over there because they got a family or whatever they got to take care of. Set your affections on things above. Where are we going? We're going above, aren't we? And the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, and poof, we're up. Catch us up. Now notice verse 3. Why? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Why seek and why set? Why, why take our mindset? By the way, we're here on the earth in the now, right? This morning, hold on to here, come back to Romans 4. There's a great part of this verse here we were looking at this morning, and, and, and I'm going to throw it in here now because when you begin to seek and set, seek out the information, get the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, get the prudence, get the verses into your thinking, and then go set your agenda, go set your mind where it needs to be. Romans 4, verse 17, the end of the verse, and calleth God, okay? And uh, he believed even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. You know what God says? You and I are already seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In God's mind, we are already there. Now, in our mind, where are we? We're still right here with another 115 degree day. Ugh, 50 something of them, I, I heard. You know, it's just like enough, you know? I mean, I understand we got hell for three or four months, but man, this is ridiculous, <laughs> right? We're sitting here. You know what God says? You're already up here in the 75 degree weather, sitting up here in heavenly places. 
you're already up there in your campsite, sitting where you need to be, enjoying who you are in Christ in the heavenly places. You're already there. That's why in Romans 5, 6, sorry, Romans 6, verse 11, he'll say, Reckon it to be so of you as well. Now that's, I kind of jumbled that verse all up, okay? You know what, folks? Colossians 3, verse 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. What a way to be thinking about this. Life around you, you know what God says? You're already up here, man. It's already a done deal. You're glorified, Romans 8 says. You're already there. And yet, what do we do? No, man, I'm not. I'm right here. I got the wife. I got the kids. I got the bills. I got all. And Rome. And you know what God's word says? Here's how to have the appropriate. Come over to Ephesians 6. Here's how to have the appropriate attitude. Hold on to Colossians 3 because we ain't done yet. Uh, Ephesians 6. Here's how to have Ephesians 5. Let's start there. Here's how to have the appropriate understanding. So, see, folks, the issue here of godliness and being profitable and having the promise of the life that now is, the issue is thinking like God would think about the work that needs to be done and then delighting and going and doing that. Now, watch Ephesians 5. Look at verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. All right? Everybody, we understand what drunk with wine to excess is. You're stumbling around, you know, in, in, in the dark with the lights on, okay? But the thing is, is what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? You got it, Ephesians? Hold on and flip over to Colossians 3, where we were just a minute ago. You guys with the digits in the, in the books, you can figure it out. Colossians 3, verse 16. Notice what letting the being filled with the Spirit, Colossians 3.16, the first part of this verse, what does he say? Let the word of Christ dwell in you, how? Richly, in all wisdom. So you know what the being filled with the Spirit, go back to Ephesians 5, is? Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Taking the word in, letting it dwell, be at home, go to work. Motivate you, move you. The love of Christ constrains us. Now look at Ephesians 5. Being filled with the Spirit. Verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody. Notice the next three words. In your heart. Being filled, one of the monikers, one of the marks of what being filled with the Spirit is, is having a harmony, having a melody in your heart as unto the Lord. He ain't talking about singing out in church. We like you singing out in church, by the way. I know some of you are over there going, man, man, just mouth, if I can just say this long enough, everybody thinks I'm singing. <laughs> you know? I got that. I understand that. Okay? Because sometimes I'm up here going and doing the same thing. I hope they don't know I don't know the words of this song. <laughs> you know? Most of those songs I know the words to. There's, every now and then James throws one I don't not quite, I go, oh, yeah, okay. One of the marks is speaking to yourself as having a harmony, a melody. When you have harmony in your heart, you know what you don't have? Unrest, grief, instability. Verse 19, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto who? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The second year mark of being filled with the Spirit is a thankful heart. Being thankful. But being thankful to who? To the Godhead. Why? Because they've richly blessed me with everything. They've Colossians 2 10 me. They've made me complete in Christ. They've given me everything. I'm good to go. Woohoo! Thank you, Lord. Verse 21. Here's the third one. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves to who? One to another. That's having a servant's heart. Submission, sub, up, turn upside down, coming along. It's serving one another. You see, everybody thinks the next verse, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, that their submission, but verse 21 happens before verse 22. And how am I supposed to be interacting with you and I, with each other? In a servant heart, a submissive heart, putting others before yourself. Now you get into the wives. They have a role to play. And then verse 25, you've got the husbands. They have a role to play. 
a, a, a thing to do. But you know where it's all done? Being filled with the Spirit. Come down to chapter 6, verse 1. Now you got children. Uh-oh. Now you Because husbands and wives make the marriage. Folks, the kids don't make the marriage. Genesis chapter number 1, Adam and Eve are joined. The man's going to leave his mom and dad, cleave to his wife. They become one flesh. And there's a period at the end of that verse. The family comes next. The kids don't make the marriage. They make the family. So now he's going to give you some instructions on children, how to be parents. Verse 2, 3, 4. Verse 5, servants. Now we're going to go talk about your workplace. All of this is to be done in seeking it out and setting your affections on things above. What does the Word of God to me today say about my life? You know, he just hit every point. We're not done yet. He's hit every point in your life. Ephesians 4, 6. By the way, you see that verse 4? Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and their admonition of the Lord. When the, kids, when the twins were going to be born 25 years ago, that's amazing. Anyway, you know what happened? I sat down with this verse. That, that, that phrase, bring them up, bring them, don't send them. That means you're going, bring them with you. Interesting. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He goes all the way back into Genesis back there with Abraham. And the little boy asks his dad, Dad, why do we go to the temple and worship and do all this stuff? And dad says, glad you asked. About time. And his dad sit there and God says of Abraham, you will teach your children. And I know it. And that nurture and admonition of the Lord is to sit down with them. First of all, you're bringing them to church. You're bringing them to study. And then you are instilling in them the doctrines of grace and the grace life. And I'll tell you what, folks, when you begin, that's forming Christ in you. When you sit there and you say, you know what, as a servant, as a worker, look at verse 5. Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. You look at that job and you know who you're doing it for? The paycheck. Most everybody says that. The benefits. No, I'm doing it for Christ. Because as his ambassador, that job site needs me to be there and to put on display him and who he is. A little different way to think about it. A little attitude adjustment. Verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That singleness of your heart. Going, you know what, man? I have to work because I got a wife and I got kids. And you know what a wife requires? Stuff. Do you know what kids require? Stuff. Right? Do you know what a husband requires? Stuff. A lot of stuff, okay. <laughs> and you know what happens? Paul says, let him that work, him that worketh not, what's he not going to get to do? Eat. He looks over there and he says, if you're not taking care of your own, you're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. <laughs> That's serious. But you know what I can do? Come back to Colossians 3 now. Is I can come into life and I can labor in that life. Your life looks different than mine. When I uh, talk to the young people that get married, I tell them your marriage will never look like your mom and dad's marriage. Because you're not your mom and dad. You're you. It's going to look like you make it look. Your life's the same way. It's not going to look like Rick's life. It's going to look like your life. We all come from different backgrounds, socially, economically, ethnically, all of that. And you know what? It's going to look like you. But in that life, you know what you're to do? You're to do verse number 4, Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life? Wait a second. I'm seeking, I'm setting, I'm learning, I'm putting, I'm having Christ formed in me. He's my mindset. He's how I think about things. He comes along and he's my life. And you know what I'm going to do? 
He's formed in me. Why? Because he is my life. My wife and I, we're going to raise the kids this way. We're going to do this job. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Whatever. And that's okay. That's because it's your life. But who am I putting on display? Him. In my life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. It's fascinating to me that when Paul, come back to 1 Timothy 4, when Paul talks about our life now in time, he associates it, he connects it with the life that we're going to have in eternity. 1 Timothy 4, verse number 8. 1 Timothy 4, verse number 8. For, godly, for bodily exercise profit a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. All the things of life, godliness, God-likeness, putting God on display. You know what that says to you? That says, man, there it is. Boy, what a way to labor. What a place to labor in, to work in. Having promise of the life that now is. Do you know that if you go out and you take, you take Romans 12, Ephesians 3, Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, you study down through those passages, R12, E4, C3. You study down through those passages, it'll take you a lifetime just to do one. It'll take you half a lifetime to figure out all of it he's trying to tell you to do. But you go and you put that in life, and you practice that. You're going to go this morning, you're going to go get some lunch. When they bring you your food and it's cold, how do you respond to that? Throw it at them, yell at them, scream at them, go back there, see the chef. You know, they'll kick you out, probably. Better have your mask on, okay? Or, or do you just say, hey, you know, there's, it's not right. Can we, and, and you do it with... Be ye kind, tender-hearted, you know? Go down the road and Rick cuts you off on the freeway because I'm a little quicker than you. How do you respond? <laughs> go up and wave at me? Or do you just say, you oh, know, there goes, there goes Rick, you idiot. <laughs> there he goes. How do you respond to that? See? It doesn't say, Paul never anywhere says, turn the other cheek and get walked over. He says, be ye angry. Anger's a wonderful motivator. Fix it. Get it done. Fix what's wrong. But then he says, but sin not. Be angry and sin not. Don't let anger move you over into the wrong category where the emotion of anger controls you. It's fascinating. It's a promise of the life that now is. Godliness right now, right now in time. You can look over there and you can say, you know what? I'm moving. For, I'm going to labor in doing this. I'm going to labor in being the best dad, the best husband, the best wife, the best employee. Ephesians 6, we kept, didn't keep reading, but the best boss. Man, what a way, what a, when you think about it, that's every detail of life. He says, hey, when Christ, who is our life, he's, what's the issue? Having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Come back over with me to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You know what Paul says? You need to grow up. But you need to grow up where? In him. And when you're doing that right here, right now in time. See, we're not out there talking about being missionaries to the world, are we? You know, Paul never talks like that. Church does. Churchy people do. 
Paul's never says for you to go set the world on fire for Christ. Religion says that. You know what he says? Let's see how your life's doing right at home. Let's go meddle there for a while. Because when you, you're in Ephesians 4, when you're doing that at home and you're being who you are supposed to be in Christ at home, on the job, then in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, then that begins to happen. Perfecting saints, maturing saints, growing, 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 moving forward, embracing what you know. Philippians over there, he says, when you've attained the rule, stay there. <laughs> Don't go back. Keep learning. Then you know what happens? Now you're able to go do the work of the ministry. Now you're going to have an edifying point on the body as a whole. But it starts when you're going to grow up in Him. Godliness, 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, it's profitable now and that which is to come. And we've seen that. That's been our studies in the heavenly places out there. As you begin, come over to 1 Corinthians 15. As you begin to build up into your inner man. Uh, you, you know what? Go, go get Acts 20 first. Sorry. <clears throat> I told you the list went out the door when I started. Acts 20. I do that today's references for you, and then I open my mouth and it goes away. Acts 20. In Acts 20, Paul looks to the Ephesians elders and he warns them about the coming attack on the, on the body. And then in verse number 32, he says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. That's building on that foundation, 1 Corinthians 3. You follow on down in there in that judgment seat of Christ passage there where he describes what's going to happen. And he says, Let's, you're going to build gold, silver, and precious stones and wood, hay, and stubble. You're going to build that stuff there. And when you go through the fire, the Word of God, the test of, of the doctrine, the doctrine's going to come along and he's going to burn away that wood, hay, and stubble because that's what fire does. So what's left? Gold, silver, and precious stones. Well, then the question is, is okay, what are those? And Proverbs says, gold, silver, and precious stone is wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So what's going to last? Well, I went down there the other day and I painted the church. Ouch. No, what's going to last? Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Now, is it a good thing you painted the church? Yes, because it needed it. But that's not what the pat on the back's about. Why did you paint the church? See, what was the motivation for it? There's the workman under good works. Come over to 1 Corinthians 15. You see, folks, when you labor, it's Labor Day. You're, let's labor in the right things. You're going to go to work. You're going to have kids. You're going to have family. You got in-laws. You got outlaws. You got them all, right? How do you deal with them? The Word of God will teach you. Well, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. A what? A what? A what? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Isn't that amazing? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Here's the thing. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Boy, here's our ultimate goal. Be ye steadfast. Unmovable. Isn't that amazing? Steadfast, faithful. It's required of a steward to be found faithful. You know what that means? That means no matter what comes, hell or high water, where are we? We're right here. What happens when we dwindle down to just a handful? We are right here. Steadfast, unmovable, not easily moved off of 
the center bubble. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why isn't our labor vain? Because godliness is profitable where? Now and then out there into the future. Now we don't need to read the verses, 2 Corinthians 4, where it works for us an exceeding weight of glory. We just got to put in right now. Just labor. Just work in where you're at. Don't work where I'm at. You don't work. You, you work in where I'm at, don't work. <laughs> you work where you're at. Go in and look at. Say, hey, wait a minute. We gotta, I have an issue. Okay, let's fix the issue. What's going on? What am I doing? What am I not doing? I, where's the answer? Right there. See? And man, when you do that, you know what happens? You become steadfast. You become unmovable. And then you, be, you begin to put on godliness. Contentment with godliness is great gain. Usually they say, well, anyway, who cares what they say? It's Labor Day. We've got the weekend. Have a good time. Just don't forget to let's be laboring about the right labor. Let's remember who we are and what we're forming inside of us and what we're building up, what we're growing up, because it has an impact in eternity. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. Lord, and above all, we thank you for who we are in your Son, for everything that you've given to us, for all the spiritual blessings, for the completeness, for all grace, for all sufficiency for, in all things. And Lord, I just pray that we have that heart of thanksgiving and that we, have, we allow your love for us to be what motivates us down through and to do. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory in everything that we say and do. In your name we pray. Amen. All right.